And welcome into Gator Bites on the 1010XL.com podcast network. Also being simulcast on the Florida Gator 1010XL Facebook page. Today's Gator podcast is brought to you by Southeast Orthopedic Specialist, the Northeast Florida's leading orthopedic center, providing an unparalleled level of care across numerous locations in both Jacksonville and St. Augustine. That includes Riverside, Northside, the Southside, the Beaches, Fleming Island, and St. John's. I'm the hacker, Ryan Green. It is the middle part of July. SEC Media Days next week up in Nashville as we are on the doorstep of the 2023 college football season. He is Graham Marsh. Graham, the last time you and I talked, Florida was hot on the recruiting trail. They were not red hot on the recruiting trail. And that is what Billy Napier and Florida have done. Over the last couple of weeks, I had the chance to talk to one one young man on my radio show here in Jacksonville, Fletcher Westfall, the four-star offensive tackle from Virginia. I asked him flat out, what was it about Florida? What was it about Billy Napier? He said, look, Napier, Coach Napier is not telling us that we're Alabama. We're not Clemson, right? We're not built. You got to come here, get your hands dirty. You got to want to rebuild a once-proud program And I got to tell you, Graham, that message is resonating because the Gators are getting a lot of really good players. Yeah, it was it was a a campfire last time we spoke and now it's a forest fire of uh, of recruiting. Yeah, I mean. And I'm sure there's some uh, financial incentive uh, (laughs) that but but listen, maybe a little bit. It's not like Florida is the only school giving out financial incentives, so. There has to be some weight to the message, right? Because obviously, like a kid like Fletcher Westfall, I'm sure. Florida was not the only program to offer him a nice NIL deal. No, it, he is a very desirable player. He chose Florida over Clemson, Arkansas, Auburn was in the mix. He told me, this is the life of these recruits. I couldn't believe this. Throughout his entire recruiting process, he went on 84 visits. Oh, my God. Over the last two and a half years. 84 visits. Now, some colleges he went to, obviously, more than once. But he said roughly 50 schools offered him 84 visits since the beginning of his sophomore year. That's crazy. 84 in two years. I mean, basically, it's all his parents. It's almost every weekend in the offseason. Almost. It is pretty much. You know, you're talking, you figure one visit per weekend. We're talking about two, two and a half years, 84 visits. Do the math on that. That's. 40 weekends over the last two years each year that he's at a college campus. Think, think about those parents that have to work Monday through Friday. And then, I, I mean, it's their kid. You know, and obviously they, they enjoy the visits and stuff. I'm not saying they're they're exactly miserable on these visits, but that's a lot, man. It's the life of a, an athlete like Fletcher Westfall that had, like I said, 50-plus um, offers. All right, Florida currently 19 commitments in the class. The interesting thing, and we talked about this briefly last time you and I were on together, of the 19, only 15 or 15 of the 19 are outside the state of Florida. Only four are inside the state of Florida. Again, I don't know exactly what that means. It's interesting that Billy Napier is going to Maryland, Virginia, Texas, Mississippi, Georgia, and he's getting great players to come down but only four of the 19 current commitments are from the Sunshine State. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, yeah. But again, we talked about this last time. I don't know how much that has to do with Billy Napier as it does, just the state of recruiting now in general. And and I understand. I mean, I think you brought up last time that, you know, Georgia's cleaning up in their own state, but Georgia's cleaning up in every state, mm-hmm. seemingly, right? You know? So, listen, if that's – if that's what it is and that's what it takes to get the type of class that Billy Napier is building, then so be it. You know, I'd like to see a couple more guys from, from Florida. I think it's just means a little more when you're from the state, I guess. But if he brings in a bunch of studs that perform on the field, who cares? The question about this class, and I didn't ask, I mean, I've had a couple of these guys on. I'm not asking them this because that would not be – to me, appropriate to ask them, but I do think it's a question a lot of Gator fans, recruiting fans are wondering. Right now, on every website, they're in the top five of recruiting for 2024. They're, for Florida standards, what we've known for the last decade, they are on fire, as we've talked about. If the 2023 season is the struggle we believe it will be, or most of us believe it will be, 
you know, seven and five, six and six, whatever it turns out to be, can you keep a top five recruiting class in place if you lose that many games? It's going to be tough. Um, but what I think you've done is let's let's look at this as like a worst case scenario. Okay, let's say they have a disaster season and there's a decent amount of recruits that end up jumping ship. Well, in the past, part of the issue there has been, okay, we had we had a class we really liked that was, you know, sixth in the country. And as the season went along, the season doesn't go as planned, a lot of guys jump ship, that ends up being 12th in the country or whatever when it's all said and done on early signing day. Well, if now they're... I think most sites have Florida third in the country right now, some fourth. Yeah, 24-7 has them third. On three had them second. I don't know if they've dropped to three or not, but you're right. Most in the top five and some in the top three. So if you're three now, and again, let's let's just say worst case scenario happens, they're not very good and some recruits do jump ship. Well, maybe three only slips to six instead of six jumping to 12 or whatever. You know what I mean? So and that again, that's only worst case scenario. The the stronger and stronger and stronger you can build it now, the worse the the more manageable that fallout would be come the season. What about and again, I don't know if he's telling this to every commitment, but he told Fletcher Westfall this because Westfall told me this, and I've heard it from more than one player. That basically what Napier is saying is, if you want to go to Georgia, you're not going to build anything. If you want to go to Alabama, you're not going to build anything. Obviously, it, it's easier I guess is the message you come to Florida we need your help I mean we need you does Georgia necessarily need you maybe not we need you to rebuild this once proud program and kids are obviously listening to that yeah 100 percent. I mean he's right um you know I'm sure if they if they build the program and have a couple of great seasons oh the message will change that won't be the message anymore but yeah that's the game, though. Of course it is. And and I'm sure Kirby Smart said the same thing when he was really starting to get it rolling is, look, does Bama need you? Does Ohio State need you? We need you. I'm sure it was the same thing. Um, there there are kids that do buy into that and like that, though. And, you know, you just spoke you spoke with Fletcher Westfall. I think he's clearly one of them. There's a reason he committed to the Gators. There's a reason he didn't, com- he didn't commit to Clemson, which is a more built program than Florida is right now, even though Clemson hasn't been – quite as high as they were four or five years ago the last two three years but still um yeah I mean it's it's that along with the fact that I mean we have to talk about the the underlying part of this the the NIL part it it seems like the when they rebranded to Florida Victorious it seemed like they really figured some stuff out there well right? they were embarrassed by the Jaden Rashada situation and which with, they should have been with good reason that was a cluster on both ends it was a cluster on Rashada's part, more so than maybe what was made public in his camp, it was also a cluster from the Florida part, and it made Florida look bad. And I think after you get made look bad and in that situation, that publicly, you got to figure out some stuff and you got to figure it out pretty quick when it comes to NIL to Florida's credit. Like you said, I think that was their wake up call and they did figure some stuff out pretty quickly. Yeah, and it's clearly showing, right? And again, like, I, I I agree with you, and and your uh, interview with Fletcher was great, and and the message and all that, and the message is awesome. We we know there's some sort of there's some underlying motivation to sign at a certain place. Not with all of them, though. Not I with mean, all of them. I, not with all of them for but, sure. But yeah. but it. My point is, after the Rashada situation, it would have been really easy for this class to have wound up a disaster. Because the collective was just in shambles, and it it would it's it would have been an easy way also for other coaches to say that that's representative of their entire program and look at how much of a mess they are overall. Clearly, no one communicates. Clearly, no one's nobody's on the same page. Look at look at what happened. That's not what's happening. They 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 had a script that had to be flipped from the NIL side and from the program side from an image perspective, and they did. If you look at the last six months. For the Gators, I guess it's more because it's July now, more like eight months, dating back to like December. 
Florida had some pretty bad image things they had to fight, and it seems like they've done a masterful job of doing so with Billy Napier at the head of that. I mean, you had the Rashada deal. You had, uh, who's now entering the transport of the Jalen Kitna deal. And, like, that's tough, man. Like, how do you overcome that? And then you have a bad season that they had on top of that. Like you also have a mass exodus of guys leaving the program, right? Like, and somehow we sit here in mid July, and I, I mean, I think he's he's kind of swayed both of it. We feel pretty damn good about Napier and his program right now, right? Oh no, absolutely, a lot better than I did. Now again, that has a way of changing pretty quickly. We'll get to that in a moment. NIL was a huge deal. The message Napier's sending is a huge deal, but it also goes to show you if you get the quarterback early on how the recruiting class takes shape. Oh, my God. DJ Lagway was one of the first guys that committed in 2024, a four-star on 24-7, a five-star on other websites. He is consistently, though, considered to be a top-five quarterback in America. And you get the quarterback, others will follow, and we've seen that after the Gators got DJ Lagway. It's not dissimilar from – and I know that that class ended up falling apart, so it may not be the best example – it didn't fall apart that much. It was more the season that followed fell apart. But it's not dissimilar from when Jim McElwain was in Gainesville and they got Matt Corral pretty early. Um, for like, uh, yeah, for a couple a month or two. Right, but but that became, I mean, Jamar Chase was committed. Yeah, you got Matt Corral, while. Jamar Chase committed the next day. I remember right, that's talking what I'm saying. to like, him, yeah. Exactly. So that that's, that's kind of the same idea. Um, with DJ Lagway, obviously, it's been a much – longer more marathon really in it for the long haul type of process um but yeah i mean if and if dj lagway is what he's expected to be then i think he's gonna play pretty damn early as well well there's not really anybody stopping him right that, that's I mean, kind of a that gator quarterback room do you think that's kind of another maybe another feather in lagway's cap when he when he pitches to other guys to join the class is this like not only am I the QB, I'm I'm the leader of this class. I'm I'm vocally helping out Florida and, and convincing a lot of these guys to come. But I get to also say, look, man, I'm probably going to be the dude there in like two years, right? Again, who else is in front of him? No, it's a big deal. I mean, Graham Mur. I don't. I think Mertz is his last year of eligibility, and then what? I mean, you really have nothing else because is it, like, is it the same? If I'm committing somewhere where I may not play for three, four seasons. I mean, again, you got Jack Miller, Max Brown, and that's pretty much it, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So so DJ gets to say that to, to kids his age. Like, look, man, like I'm all in and I'm gonna be their guy in two years, right? Like it's not just it's not just come with me and let's ride the bench for four seasons. Like we're gonna go play. It's it comes it comes full circle back to that Fletcher Westfall thing of we need your help. And what does that really? What does that actually mean? That means you're going to play. That means playing time, right? And, and yeah, no. And and put yourself in these kids' shoes. And we got to move on to some other come 2023 stuff in a moment. But if you have coaches pitching you left and right, you know this coach this day, that coach that day, and then Billy Napier gets in front of you and you say, "Look, the coach that talked to you yesterday. If you don't go there, they're going to be just fine, because they have seven, eight, nine guys just like you." Me, on the other hand, you can come in and play right away, and we need you. Being told that you're needed, I think, like you said, does resonate with some guys, and Florida has found that secret sauce, at least right now. And apparently, the rumor is it's not going to stop. There are a lot of guys that are set to commit over the coming days and weeks that look like Florida leans as it does stand. Today's Gator Bites podcast is brought to you by Southeast Orthopedic Specialist for the highest quality care. You can rely on Southeast Orthopedic Specialist for any orthopedic injury or concern. You can log on to their website by going to se-ortho.com, and you can listen for Southeast Orthopedic Specialist, the good doctor, Kevin Murphy, on Thursday mornings in the 7 o'clock hour with Jeff and Dan right here on 1010XL for his weekly analysis of injuries in sports. So Utah quarterback Cam Rising, who tore his ACL in the Rose Bowl, Goes on Salt Lake City Radio earlier this week with my friend Bill Riley, formerly a radio host here in Jacksonville. I'll have Bill on as 
the Utah-Florida game approaches. And he tells Bill Riley out in Salt Lake City that he's on track to play August 31st against Florida. You and I have talked about this, but it's coming more into focus as we get closer to that game. Ah, play the best, right? To be the best, you got to beat the best. I don't want to play Ball State. I don't want to play Charleston Southern. I don't want to play the Citadel. I don't want a quote, a quote, tune-up game. A lot of Gator fans said that. Well, okay. Now you're the first SEC team ever that's ever to go to Salt Lake City. Thursday night, national TV, prime time to essentially kick off the college football season. And the All-American type quarterback that Utah wasn't sure was going to be able to play appears that he's on track to play. If that is not a hornet's nest that Florida is going into, I don't know what is. It's one of those instances, Graham, well, be careful what you ask for. Because at certain points, you might actually get it, and it may not be as rewarding as you thought. For those of you that wanted to play the best, talk to me on Friday, September 1st. Your thoughts. I agree. I totally agree. I mean, we're aligned on this. We Some some counterparts here at, at 1010XL, 92.5 FM are not aligned. Oh, you got to play the best. They, they're all it's it's about competition. It's a, and listen. Yes, it is about competition. Yes, it's about playing the best. But when you play in the SEC, you probably already play the best. So right. When you, you already have schedule harder than you need it to be. LSU, Georgia, Florida State. Uh, I mean, you're playing the best teams in America. Why go at a road game against a Pac-12 team that was in the Rose Bowl last year? You're the first SEC team to ever go out there. That could get ugly in Salt Lake City. It could. It could get ugly really fast. Um, that's going to be – that crowd is going to be electric. Oof. They're going to be so excited for that game, as they should be. Um, Based on everything we talked about and how it ended last year. And it's year. a revenge game. Bro. Yeah. It's a revenge game with the same QB, with the same coach. And here's the problem. Last season – when the game was in Gainesville, you had all of the like, ener- like intangible energy of the game went in Florida's way. I think Utah Utah was clearly the better football team, even though they lost. I mean, just look at how how both teams finished their seasons. I think the I think the main reason Florida won that game is first of all Anthony Richardson just turned into Cam Newton for a game. Mm-hmm. Secondly, like I just said, all the all the energy heading into the game leaned Florida's way. You had a brand new coach. You were in the swamp. It was Napier's debut. It was this quarterback that we were, we were all stoked about. That was also a night game, and we know how the swamp gets at night. And Cam Rising made a terrible throw with 30 seconds left. Yes, and with all that, with all that positive energy, Utah arguably still should have maybe won that football game. Because you're right, if if Cam Rising doesn't make that really bad interception to Amari Bernie, uh, we're talking about a different winner from that game. There's almost no chance they don't score on that drive. I was convinced they were scoring on that mm-hmm. drive. Um, you look, you flip that to this year, Utah is still the better football team, and all the energy goes Utah's way. Cam Rising shouldn't was probably not going to be on track. Now he is, and he's going to play. So their fans are going to be psyched to see their guy rally back only nine months removed from an ACL injury. They're at home, revenge game. Florida doesn't have the the new car smell on the program anymore. We're a year in. It's it's a hornet's nest. Does it look great? No, and, and, and my point in this is, look, There's no need to do it. Is it fun for us in the media, fun for you, the fans, to talk about Florida, Utah more than it is Florida, Middle Tennessee State? Yeah, it probably is. But at the end of the day, you beat Middle Tennessee State, you get off to the year on a positive star, you get ready for conference play. That's not going to happen this year. I'm going to go out and I'm not going to go out and, and sugarcoat it. I like Utah to win that game right now. Pretty convincingly. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, you're behind the eight ball. And it's not even September yet until the next day. And then you still have, in the first month, 
you know, your Tennessees, your Kentuckys. Uh, I, I just think Florida fans that want to play the best and for Florida media that say you don't need tune-up games, that's not the world of college football we live in. The world of college football we live in, they make a playoff. If you go undefeated in the Southeastern Conference, I don't care who you play out of conference, you're going to the playoff. Florida has the added issue of playing Florida State already, so they already have a tough non-conference to go with eight conference games. Now, because you got so much pushback from fans about wanting to play the best, now you're scheduling the likes of Utah. That's not going to work out. They're going to lose. Next year's even worse. Next year, eight conference games with Florida State, Miami, and UCF. That is insanity that Florida's doing that. Insanity. They um, There's no need to do it. And, and for Gator fans, you better not complain. For those of you that wanted this, when they lose that Utah game, I don't want to hear anybody complaining about it. Uh, and a lot of times when the game happens, it's – it's like easy to be able to look because it's fresh and it's easy to be able to see, well, look at how good of an opponent they played. But fast forward to like the end of the season, Gator fans will because we watch the games every week, but does random guy that's a college football fan, he's not going to remember that Florida had this crazy tough schedule. He's just going to look at, a five-win season right. or whatever. He's going to talk about Billy Napier going six and seven in year one and six and seven again in year two. Correct. So it's to your point, we've all, you and I have always been aligned on this again. Competition, playing the best, whatever. Well, there's no reward for doing that. That's the problem. The con absolutely outweighs the pro. The pro last year was they beat Utah, right? Great. And they still lost six games. Yes. You got nothing out of that win. Now you're going on national TV to kick off the college football season, Thursday night ESPN before Labor Day. And if you get boat raced, the pro to me or the con to me so far outweighs the pro. Because nobody is going to sit there if you go to Utah and get boat raced. No one three weeks later is going to sit there and say, well, but at least they're playing the best. Yeah. No one's going to say that. Now, the opposite, if we want to be glass half full, is I don't foresee an issue happening here, but if it does, if Florida goes out there and wins, that's great. But if they turn around in a couple of weeks and lose to Kentucky and Tennessee, nobody's going to care about that Utah game. Yes. I mean, people will care in terms of it'll be a great win, but no one's going to, again, no one's going to say, well, but at least Florida went out there and played the best. Like, that's not like a thing you get rewarded for. I just think some people in the media started talking about that, and fans are like, yeah, I'm, I don't want to play Charleston Southern anymore, the Citadel. And it picked up steam, and it picked up steam, and it picked up steam. And okay, you've made your bed. Now you're going to lie in it. The hay is in the barn. Now they're playing these games. And, uh, man, again, the first SEC team ever to go out there, those people in Salt Lake City will be losing their minds. Of course they will. On that they, Thursday as they night. they should be. As they should be. It's going to be the best night of their lives. It freaking should be. But again, it's like, I I would have no problem with scheduling these tough opponents if there was legitimate reward for your program to do so. But there's not. It's just a hard game. And I always hear, well, they can recruit. Yeah, you're going to recruit in Utah. You're going to go out to Utah because the one four-star guy that's in Provo is going to come to the get for University of Florida because they spent two days out there playing the University of Utah. You know it's what makes just, recruiting easier? Yeah. Having more wins at the end of your schedule. It's just nonsense to me. It's a, it's a bad deal. And next year's even worse. I, I cannot believe Florida has 11 Power 5 games next year. 11. They got eight in the conference and three with Florida State, Miami, and UCF. Hey, like I said, you made your bed. Now you're going to have to lie. But, in you, it. but listen, if college football was set up to reward you for playing tough opponents like that out of conference, it would make sense. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't reward you. It doesn't. There's no benefit to playing these games outside of their fun. Quick. Georgia won the national title last year. Who'd they beat out of conference? Correct. Exactly. Does anybody have any idea? No. 
No, and no one was sitting there when they were holding the trophy at the at the end of the year saying, "Well, but but they really should have played somebody else out of con." No one was saying that. Right. No one thought that. It's just it's nonsense. The Skater Bites podcast is brought to you by Southeast Orthopedic Specialist, the Northeast Florida's leading orthopedic center, providing an unparalleled level of care across numerous locations in both Jacksonville and St. Augustine. That includes Riverside, Northside, the South Side, the Beaches, Fleming Island, and St. John's. We certainly thank Southeast Orthopedic Specialists. As we wrap up, Graham, SEC Media Days next week. A lot of the preseason magazines have come out. I had the chance earlier this week on Hacker After Dark to catch up with Phil Steele, who I think year in and year out has the best of the preseason college football magazines. And uh, he is pretty much in line with the Athlons and the Lindys of the world. I've seen Florida only as high as third in the East. I've seen him as low as fifth in these preseason magazines. And a lot of it has to do with people think Florida, South Carolina, and Kentucky are kind of on the same level. But Florida has to go to the Commonwealth and has to go to williams Bryce, two road games that Florida has to go, and that's why South Carolina and Kentucky are getting the lean over Florida in these preseason predictions. The only – and they got to go to Baton Rouge as well. Got to go to Baton Rouge. I mean, it's it's tough. The only – um, I think the only uh, – out of all their tough SEC opponents, I think the only one they're hosting is uh, Tennessee, right? Arkansas. Okay, Arkansas. But yeah. I was thinking more just like their annual opponents. Right. Um, out of their annual opponents, it's just Tennessee. Tennessee, I, I well, yeah, your your conference home games are Tennessee, Arkansas, Vanderbilt. Then you got the two cupcakes, and you got Florida State. So, yeah, Florida's on the road at Utah, non-conference. They're at LSU, at South Carolina, at Kentucky, at Missouri. And Missouri's Ooh. supposed to be down <laughs> But we all know how tough it is to go to Columbia. That's a weird place to play. Georgia almost lost in Columbia. Yeah. This year, this year, the team that won the national championship by 2,000 points almost lost in Columbia. They should have lost in Columbia, Missouri. They were like one-fourth. They, I think they converted a big fourth, like fourth and one. If they didn't get that fourth and one, they would have lost the game. And look, you know, hopefully Florida's better than than they're giving credit for. But there's no denying that right now if you were to go – favorite underdog in all 12 games Florida's the favorite against the two cupcakes and against Vanderbilt even though Vandy beat them last year Florida will still be the favorite are they the favorite at Missouri maybe I think they will be that that doesn't mean they're going to win it but I think I think they'll be a favorite but all right they're not going to be favorite at Utah favorite probably no no, right not favorite at Utah who's favorite Florida or Tennessee Tennessee probably even though it's in Gainesville is Florida the favorite going to Kentucky I don't think so. Florida, the favorite going to South Carolina? Maybe. They're absolutely not going to be the favorite against LSU or Georgia. No, 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 no. no, Could Florida potentially be the favorite home against Arkansas? Yeah, depending on how good Arkansas is with K.J. Jefferson. I bet they will be. It'll depend on where they are in the season, obviously. But if that game were played today, I bet Florida would be like a three-point favorite. People in Arkansas think they're going to be pretty good. They might have one of the best quarterbacks in the conference. Yeah, but I'm not asking about people in Arkansas. I'm asking about Vegas. Well, no, well – that's no. What I'm saying is, I mean, I don't. I, truthfully, I don't know if Florida's better than Arkansas. Are they the home? Are they going to be the favorite because they're the home team? Yeah, maybe. If the game is in Fayetteville, Arkansas might be the favorite. It's yeah, hundred percent. It's a coin toss that, game. That, that's what I was saying. Yeah. And then Florida State. You know, I would think Florida State's going to be the favorite. The point is, Florida's going to be the favorite in three games. The two toss ups, probably Missouri and Arkansas. I could argue Florida's an underdog in seven of their twelve games right now. Which is pretty striking if you think about it. And a lot of those are are like hefty underdogs. Those aren't three point underdogs. Like I mean, Georgia, they'll be a fourteen point dog probably, right? Easy, easy. I would think maybe even more than that. LSU, they'll be a, probably a fourteen point dog. In Baton Rouge, towards the end of the year, depending on what Florida is playing for at that point. Florida State coming to Gainesville is probably going to be a ten point favorite, if not more, depending on how good they are. You know, let's end with this. With Media Days on the horizon, Ricky Pearsall, Jason Marshall, among those that will be out there with Billy Napier in Nashville next week. I do think Florida, we know they have issues at quarterback. Their running game is going to be awesome, depending on the O-line. I don't know if their O-line is going to gel because they've got a lot of new guys there. Their O-line's big. 
They got some big guys for Montrell Johnson and for Trevor Etienne to run behind. Skill position players concern me a little bit. I'm sorry. When Ricky Pearsall is your best wide receiver, that's a problem. Uh, tight end, who really knows? And then they got questions on defense. So I'm trying to find a way to have some silver lining here. I think the D-line will be good. Linebackers, how are you going to replace Ventro Miller and Amari Bernie? Shamar James needs to have a huge year. Yeah. He's like he might be the most important player in terms of second year development on the team. But for those that think we're negative about the team, I mean, tell me what is there to be positive about at least right now with that schedule and this roster in mid, mid in the mid part of July. Jason Marshall should be really good. Should be. So yes, I could, I like by the end of the season he could be first on draft pick material. Oh, I think so. Yeah, and and, and um, I, I like Jason Marshall a lot, but but I mean the other three guys in the secondary. But I mean. We've seen here in Jacksonville when Jalen Ramsey was playing for the Jags. Just because you have a great corner does not mean you have a good defense. No. <laughs> so you, it really comes down to, especially in college football, your defense comes down to your defensive line. I mean, it's all about your defensive line. And they um, got some dudes there. I agree. They got they, some guys. They've got some dudes. Um, uh, um, what's I'm forgetting his name. Uh, Princely Uman Miela. He's got to have a great year. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, there's a couple guys they're like really relying on, I think, and those couple guys are going to kind of make or break how that defense looks. I mean, offensively, the uh, back to the O line, you got to be able to have a good O line because Florida's offense this year is going to be predicated on running the football and getting to third and manageable. If yeah. your offensive line is not good and you're in second and long and third and long, Florida's dead. Yeah. With what they have at wide receiver. They're not going to get a lot of third and 11s. No, they have a lot of talent, young talent at wide receiver, and maybe the likes of Andy Jean, maybe some of these young guys like Aiden Mizell will really step up, but we don't know that as we sit here right now. No, and also um, most people would agree with this, I think, unless you are just sp- – Special, special receiver takes a couple years. Like Trevor Etienne last year as a true freshman was able to just get behind the QB, take the rock, and make plays. Running back's a little more, if I'm ready, I'm ready now. Mm -hmm. Receiver's a little bit more of an art. It's a little more of a complex position. It takes typically a year in college to be able to develop mentally and really know what you're doing and develop that feel. That's why Pearsall is going to be easily the number one guy because he's the only one that's done it before. Yeah, Shorter's gone. Xavier Henderson gone as well. Leave us with this. With Media Days next week, what are you looking to hear from Billy Napier? Um, n- Knowing Billy, he'll, he's going to say the typical coach speak stuff for the most part, which is fine. I got no problem with that. What I, what I really want is I, I need to know – how they're going to win more than seven games, which he's not going to tell us on a silver platter. But I, mean, I like I said, I would sign up for seven and five right now. I would too, with no hesitation. Yeah, I would too. Um, I also would like just kind of a N- Napier's a very he's a very kind of soft spoken, quiet dude in terms of. He's not going to come out there and make a big scene, you know, in the media or whatever. But I would like to, and I will not be there. We'll have some 10th and XL representatives that will be there. I'll be at uh, ACC, actually. But I'd like to see a little more of a owning the place type of feel from Napier. A little bit more, I've been here before, I'm ready to kick some ass type of vibe. Media days next week. We are getting very, very close to the start of fall camp. And, of course, the Gators and Utah, August 31st out in Salt Lake City. He is Graham Marsh. I'm the hacker, Ryan Green. Thank you for watching and listening to Gator Bites on the 1010XL.com podcast network and on the Florida Gator 1010XL Facebook page.